All right, so today we're going to talk about our project that we recently completed on large diameter shallow bore heat exchangers for ground source heat pumps. Okay, so a little background on the project. Um, this was funded by the California Energy Commission um, under a group called Building Energy Efficiency Technology and Codes and Standards Advancement. So not only were we uh, looking at an advanced technology, we were also interested in trying to provide some tools for the codes and standards team um, to integrate this uh, modeling tool into the compliance software. So hopefully that can happen um, now that we've completed the project. Uh, the timeframe for this project was July, 2016, and we recently wrapped it up in March, 2020. Uh, the team comprised of uh, Professor Angelo Zarella from the University of Padova in Italy. Um, he was, he's was he been working on the helical ground heat exchangers for many years now and has developed some simulation tools for simulating ground heat transfer. Um, so we collaborated closely with him on this. Uh, Frontier Energy was a major subcontractor responsible for the field testing in the project as well as the laboratory testing. And then Whitebacks Technology was another uh, subcontractor um, helping with the integration with Energy Plus. And then our technology partner in this was Integrated Comfort. Uh, they're based in West Sacramento and they developed the heat exchangers that we tested. So just quickly on the agenda for today's uh, presentation, um, I'm gonna overview the project uh, and then talk about the models that we were developed um, for simulating heat transfer in the ground. Uh, then we'll talk about some lab testing and the associated model calibration that that was used for. Uh, and then with the with the validated model, we did some parametric analysis and, and Antosh, I'm gonna hand up the presentation over to Antosh to present the results of that, as well as the integration with Energy Plus using response factors and some, some conclusions. So a little bit on the background and motivation for this project. Um, you know, California is going through an electrification process, which means a lot of heat pumps are being installed to replace uh, natural gas fired furnaces. Um, and the most common type of heat pump being used is an air source heat pump, which exchanges uh, heat with the air that is hottest when cooling is needed the most in the building and coldest when heating is the most uh, needed in, most in the building. And so this results in um, lower thermodynamic efficiency when you're trying to cool a building um, and rejecting to hotter temperatures, uh, your efficiency is degraded. So soil provides a much more stable temperature uh, for heat exchange. If you're able to reject this heat instead to the, the surrounding soil, um, there's, there's kind of two benefits there. One is that the soil temperature is fairly uh, constant throughout the day. So you're not experiencing uh, peaks in energy draw for the equipment. So there's not a, a peak uh, during a particular day. Uh, it's fairly stable power draw. So that helps the, the, the grid, the electric grid. And then also soil is a much more moderate temperature than am ambient air, especially during the hottest time of the day or the coldest time of the day. So temperatures in the ground are, you know, when you're a couple meters down are anywhere from 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which happens to be very close to comfortable indoor conditions. And so you can get some benefits by uh, exchanging heat with the ground um, thermodynamically that way. Uh, ground source heat pumps have been around for many decades, uh, but there have been market barriers that have prevented the widespread adoption of these systems in California and, and around the country. Um, and probably the, the most, uh, the biggest barrier is the, the cost, so the first cost of installation. So they're fairly expensive to install. The typical, um, very, the vertical deep bore installations can, are around $15 a foot. That, that number really varies depending on your jurisdiction. And, uh, and the surrounding soil and, and other things. Um, but generally in the Central Valley, you need about 200 foot bo deep bore for every ton of cooling or heating capacity. Um, so for a three ton uh, system, you would need three of these bores installed. And to dig that deep, you need specialized equipment. Uh, this equipment is not necessarily um, nearby the construction site where you might be installing the system. So in some cases, you have to bring this equipment from out of state, and that can add to the initial cost of installation. So a little bit more on, on some different ground heat exchanger designs. On the left-hand side, you see a few different diagrams. Um, the first is the vertical, um, which is probably the most common. This is where you dig a 100 to 300 foot deep hole, and you put a pipe down the hole. It turns a U at the bottom, it comes straight back up. 
Um, there's also a horizontal design. So instead of putting all that pipe vertically, you can lay it down in a, in a horizontal manner, um, only a, a, in a much shallower um, in a much shallower hole. Uh, so this might be a couple meters down in the ground as, a, as opposed to several hundred feet. Um, but this obviously would require a lot more land area than the vertical bore. And so that's why it's not used as commonly. And also you'd have to excavate all that land at least a couple meters down just to get the pipe down um, deep enough to uh, interact with the, the soil. So um, this can be used, say, before you build a building. If you're, if you're going to put a foundation down, you could lay the pipe down before you set the foundation on top of it, and you would have to insulate between the two, but that would be one way of, of installing a, a horizontal loop. There's also a slinky, which is very slim, similar to the horizontal, although uh, it doesn't require quite as much land area, but you see that the pipes kind of lay on top of each other in a, in a horizontal manner and that can uh, impact performance because the pipes are interacting with one another that way. Um, and then lastly, there's the, the helical ground heat exchanger, which is the focus of this research that we're presenting on today. And it's, it's kind of like a hybrid between the vertical and the slinky method, where you're digging a 20 to 30 foot deep hole and you're putting in the slinky, but it's, but it's put in vertically and there's spacing between each of the coils. On the right, you see some, some photos of an installation at the Honda Smart House at, on UC Davis campus. It's a single family home. Uh, you see the auger digging a, a two foot diameter hole there and the slinky uh, or the, sorry, the, the helical GHE going in, um, dropping into that hole. And on the right hand side, this is, these are the specifications for that particular installation. Uh, the helical pitch was six inches. This is the distance between each of the coils. So there's some spacing between the coils. Uh, the diameter was 22 inches to fit into a 24 inch, um, 24 inch uh, diameter hole. Uh, there was 15 foot spacing between GHEs, which is on the on the larger end. If you have enough land area and you can and you can um, do that, then that that is good. But they can go down to eight feet um, apart. And, and there's some other things. the The pipe was half inch. It can in some installations they're they're three quarter inches, and then the backfill. It was native soil. Um, uh, typically, the, the contractors that install these today have used fine sand uh, for a couple of reasons. One is um, it, it prevents damaging the the pipe when you're backfilling, and there's large uh, chunks of soil. It can it can actually damage the helical heat exchanger, um, but also it's it's relatively cheap, and it and it can create good contact resistance with the uh, or good contact with the with the pipe. All right, so now going into the shallow bore technology, um, the advantage, one of the advantages is that it can be installed with readily available auger equipment. Um, this equipment can dig holes up to 36 inches in diameter and down to 30 feet deep. Um, this equipment is used to dig things like power lines or other infrastructure projects. So they're, they're more readily available and typically cheaper to get on site. And they're also a bit smaller of equipment. So that can lead to some cost savings on the installation. Um, these helical designs have also been around for a while now. Um, and, and some of the market barriers that have um, impeded its progress have been, um, there's limited installations and each of them have slightly different designs. Uh, so here's a few examples in villages at LaRue. So this is back in the, in the mid 1990s, there, were, there was an, a multifamily building built on UC Davis campus. And they attempted to install these, these shallow bore helical designs. Uh, my understanding is that the soil was quite sandy there. And so they had an issue where the, where the boreholes were actually caving in on themselves. So I think they had to shift gears halfway through that project and change the approach. Uh, the Honda Smart House uh, was a, a house built by Honda Motor Company on UC Davis campus, um, showcasing a bunch of different efficient technologies, including the ground source heat pump. In that case, there were a couple different bore designs installed within the same house. Um, I showed the one backfilled with native soil, but they also had some that um, were surrounded by a larger pipe and filled with gravel and then irrigated with, with gray water. So there were some, some different methods tried at that house. And then Parkview Place is a small multifamily building. I think there's five different units in downtown Davis. And, and that's served with 14 different um, ground heat, ex well, 14 ground heat exchanger designs that are that are consistent. 
Um, and then the other thing is that there's really no sizing methods or performance, at least before this project, for installing these systems, um, performance models, I should say. So engineers uh, do not have as much confidence when you can't model the performance. It, it makes it a, a difficult um, um, prospect to try to design and install these systems. So those are some of the things we wanted to address in this project. So uh, the project started by looking at some of the, the field, uh, by collecting some field data on some existing installations. And so we focused on three of them, one being the HANA Smart House. Uh, we were fortunate in that this system has been instrumented already for other projects. So there were, there were uh, temperature sensors in the ground. There were sensors um, sub-metering uh, some of the bores themselves so we could get individual bore flows and temperatures coming out. Um, so there was lots of instrumentation there, and that that was a great site to um, to to monitor. And then uh, Parkview Place is the is the multifamily complex. Uh, the owner allowed us to connect some instrumentation to that. Although we came in, at, it was an existing installation, so we only had access to water flow rates and temperatures at the ground heat exchanger um, itself, which means we are looking at uh, the entire bore field rather than individual. Uh, GHE bores. Um, and then the Vacaville residence is a single family home that installed a new uh, ground heat exchanger. This was a new home, uh, but the but the owner was not um, willing to let us do long-term monitoring there. So we ended up doing some short-term testing at Vacaville, which involved putting a, a test rig connecting to the ground heat exchanger, applying a constant load with an electric resistance heater, and then just looking at the temperature response of the ground. And so this can tell you something about the ground conductivity um, or effective conductivity, including uh, including contact resistance with the backfill, uh, surrounding soil, and the and the um, actual backfill itself. And then long-term testing was performed at both Parkview Place and then Honda Smart Home, where we observed actual system operation. So the heat heat pumps were heating and cooling the building uh, based on the thermostat um, signals. Oops. And um, and so we didn't have control of those loads, and instrumentation varied between uh, the the two sites quite dramatically. Like I said, the Honda Smart Home had lots of instrumentation, and the Parkview Place had uh, fairly minimal. All right, so I'm showing here some data collected at the Honda Smart Home over 273 hours um, in June of 2017. And what you can see is there, the light blue line shows the, uh, the ambient outdoor air temperature fluctuating daily. Uh, the purple line shows the temperature coming out of the ground and into the heat pump. And the red line shows the temperature leaving the heat pump and going into the ground. And so one thing you'll notice here is that in, in many of the hours of cooling, uh, the temperature being fed to the heat pump is much lower than the ambient air temperature. Um, and in some cases, it was right during the peak of ambient air. So you can, there, there is assumed to be some efficiency benefits of, of um, using cooler uh, medium to reject your heat to. And so you would expect energy savings there. Now, you'll also see that that, that temperature or, or that cycle goes beyond um, the point where the outdoor air temperature starts to cool off. So there's actually an efficiency penalty to rejecting heat to the ground in that case. And that's where you really want a model to be able to predict these so that you can you can look at this as, on the big picture and see what the overall benefit of, of rejecting to the to the ground is. In this case, we found that the that there was relatively low heat transfer. So while the temperature difference of the inlet and exit temperatures of the bore are fairly nominal, of a few degrees Celsius, uh, the water flow rate was quite low. So this this ended up being a pretty low load being rejected to the ground in each of these bores, and, and this was um, assumed to be based on uh, or caused by low soil conductivity. Uh, and ultimately, we used data like this to validate as part as a as a way to validate our our simulation model. So jumping into the models that were developed for this project, um, there were two models. One was a computational fluid dynamics model and the other was a capacitance and resistance model um, we call the CARM model, and that was developed originally by Professor Zarella in Italy, and it uses electric analogies to kind of simulate the, the heat transfer process in the ground. So the CFD model is, is highly detailed. Um, there's a 
fairly fine mesh that gives you temperature distribution, a uh, very fine uh, understanding of, of temperature distribution in the ground, in the core, and around the pipe. Um, but this results in a very uh, computationally intense process, which means that we can only simulate uh, reasonably a couple of weeks of simulation um, for uh, for hours of, of computational time. So there's some limitations there, and, and clearly you couldn't do uh, reasonably an annual simulation with a building uh, using the CFD model, at least not efficiently. But it does provide really good ground temperatures, and ultimately we use this to uh, to see if the CARM model was was behaving appropriately and and to further validate the CARM model. So going into the CARM model, um, again, this was originally developed by Professor Zarella, and in this project we improved it based on um, some calibration methods with the CFD model. And uh, this model is, is much more computationally efficient. We can run 10 years of simulation using this model in well under an hour of, simu of computational time. So here's kind of the, the schematic uh, of the, how, the models, uh, how the model works. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the, the three different zones, uh, soil zones. There's the surface zone, there's the borehole zone, and then the deep zone. In the surface zone and the deep zone, you only have axial heat exchange, so vertical up and down uh, heat exchange. There's the ambient um, uh, conditions above that are interacting with the surface zone and then the, and the borehole zone below, and then the deep zone um, interacts with the far field below the, the bore. In the borehole zone itself, uh, there is both radial heat transfer as well as, as axial vertical heat transfer. Uh, and, and also there's two different soil types that you can specify for this model. You have the surrounding soil and the surface in the deep and, and the far field borehole, but you also have the borehole backfill um, soil itself, which can be a different material property. And then if you look at the electrical schematics, uh, this is kind of how the model was designed. Um, you see uh, the pipe in the middle. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but there's a pipe going vertically in the middle of the helix. That's the, the pipe um, coming straight back up. And then the pipe number two is, a, is the helical coil. So this shows a, a top-down view of one of the coils. And what you see is there is a uh, temperature nodes and resistances uh, indicating thermal resistance of the backfill soil. There's also a capacitor, which is the thermal capacitance of that soil. And so heat is transferred from the pipe one over through the soil to pipe two. On the other side of pipe two, there's another resistance through the backfill and capacitance of that soil to the bore wall. And this repeats kind of in segments um, radially out to the far field. If you look at a vertical cross section, you see there's also uh, thermal resistances vertically. So that, that allows heat transfer to flow up and down to the surface zones and deep zone respectively. Um, and so this is kind of the general approach to the original model. And then what we found through our CFD calibration is that there's actually, in the original model, the, the heat is, is forced to transfer through that, that helical pipe. But we know that there's soil surrounding that pipe and there's heat transfer pathways around the pipe itself. And we found that there's a significant improvement by adding those parallel resistances, um, allowing heat to transfer around the pipe. Um, and that's what we ended up doing to improve the model uh, in collaboration with Professor Zarella. So this plot here shows some of the, the calibration data or, or um, where we're comparing the, the original CARM heat exchanger model, the CARM heat exchanger version two model, and then the CFD model. Um, there's two snapshots in time that we're looking at here. One's after 44 hours of simulation and one's after 120 hours. If you look at the, um, at the 44 hour plot, you'll see that the, the original CAR model actually predicts for the core node a very similar temperature as does the CFD. Um, whereas the revised model shows a slightly elevated temperature in that core uh, node. So you would, you would think that this means that the, the revised model is actually predicting a, uh, having a, a worse prediction of temperature relative to the CFD. But you also notice that the CFD predicts a temperature profile within the core zone, uh, slightly raising up as it reaches the outside bore wall. And so 
um, the the actual average temperature of the core is higher than the um, what the original CAR model uh, uh, predicted. So because the CAR model is using that node as the temperature for the entire core, you actually do want to see that temperature slightly elevated to to represent the average temperature within the core. And so that actually is an improvement over the original CAR model. And then if you look at the bore wall, the furthest um, dashed line on the right hand side, you'll see the temperatures predicted. This is a more obvious uh, comparison where you can see that the car, the revised CARM model predicts a, a uh, temperature that's closer to what the CFD is predicting than the original CARM. And then on the right-hand side, you see some contour plots. The top two are just showing temperature profiles, but the bottom one shows the comparison of the revised CARM model with the CFD model. And what you can see is that the temperatures are all within about two degrees Celsius of one another. So after the initial calibration, we, we wanted to do a lab test in order to control the, the loads being imposed in the ground and, and do a further val validation of the model. So we, we dug some actual ground heat exchangers at Frontier Energy's laboratory. We ended up installing four different bores so that we could look at the impact of multiple bore interactions. We could look at the, uh, at, at the corner of a, a bore field, so three in a corner, which is a common to have kind of an L-shaped bore field. And then we can also look at three in a row, which is also common in a, um, in a line kind of um, installation. And within this, this uh, uh, laboratory test, we placed sensors in, in the ground at five different depths. We had temperature sensors, and at three different depths, we had moisture sensors, and those temperature arrays were placed at various locations. We had uh, far field sensors that were far enough away from the bore field that they weren't interacting with the heat transfer going on within the bore field itself. So that gives you kind of the natural state of the soil. Um, then we had some sensors, uh, two sets of arrays of sensors within the core itself. One was halfway across the radius and one was at the bore wall. And then we had some sensors between the bores um, to, to see what how the boards were interacting or looking at the profile radially out from, from the bore. So as we, we worked on this project, it became pretty apparent that soil conditions can greatly impact uh, the model predictions. And that it's really important to understand the soil conditions, especially when you're trying to do a, a validation of a model. So we took soil samples from the laboratory test site and brought them back to the lab. Um, there were two soil samples collected. One was the surrounding native soil, which was a heavy clay soil um, in Davis, California. And then the other was the backfill, which was a fine sand. And we looked at the moist, uh, at the conductivity of the soil as well as other properties, but this is showing the conductivity as it changes with moisture level. So what we found is that the surrounding heavy clay soil increased conductivity by 4.2% as the moisture increased from 25% up to 42%. So there was a fairly modest improvement in conductivity with moisture uh, within that range. Um, however, the, the sand was quite sensitive to moisture. It, it increased by 450% as the moisture increased from 4.3% up to 35.5%. So the sand went from a, fairly, a fairly poor conductor at, when it was dry to actually a, a, a better conductor than the surrounding soil when it was, when it was moist. So uh, this tells us that if you're going to use fine sand as a backfill, that um, and you're doing any kind of irrigation of the of the bore field, you should really focus that irrigation to the to the core of the of the bore fields um, in order to reduce water use and in, um, or at least relative to the performance improvement per per gallon of water used. So this this shows um, a single bore test that was run in the lab, and we're comparing the CAR model predictions of the outlet temperature. Um, to the laboratory uh, measured data. And what we can see in, in the plot is that you, the yellow line indicates the measured result, and the blue line is the CAR model prediction. Um, there is some difference initially, and that's due to, due to some initial conditions that were, are not the same between the CAR model and the, and the field data. But after uh, you know, the first cycle, um, you see that the, the CAR model predictions uh, end up 
agreeing very well with the measured data. Um, we found that the root mean squared difference error between the model prediction and the um, measured data was uh, within one degree Celsius. And this is the same test uh, where we're looking at the bore wall temperature. Um, and, and what you can see again is that there's, there's a difference initially as the model kind of warms up and, and figures out what's going on. And, and, and then ultimately there's a very good agreement between the bore wall temperature observed and the bore wall temperature predicted, um, showing an RMSD error of, of 0.3 degrees Celsius from four hours into this uh, test to 36 hours. And then we did a test of a multiple bore interaction. Um, this was three bores in a row. Instead of cycling a constant load, as I showed before, we ended up imposing a constant load for over 20 hours for this test. And what we found was that the model predicted the temperature quite well um, within an RMSD error, again, of, of one degree Celsius for the outlet temperature of the, of the bore. And then similarly for the bore wall temperature, we see that the RMSD error was within 0.7 degrees Celsius for the bore wall. So this, this shows uh, the validation process that we used. And, and once we were able to, um, to get good um, predictions from the model and confidence in the model predictions, we were able to do some full annual, annual simulations with a real building to understand the energy benefits relative to air source heat pumps. So I'm gonna pass the controls over to Antosh to present the, uh, the parametric study results. Hey everyone. So I'll start off with the parametric study. Thank you very much, Curtis. Um, so in this uh, part of the study, what we did is we took the calibrated and validated CARAM model, and we also incorporated the heat pump model uh, into that uh, in, into the CARAM model. So here, uh, the heat pump performance is also changing uh, with the uh, supply and return temperature from the ground heat exchanger, uh, depending on that. Um, and we used a CPEC res model to generate the building load profiles in two California climate zones, uh, the climate zone being uh, Sacramento and Riverside. Um, this is a single family home, um, two story, about uh, 2,700 square foot. Um, and we used CPEC res to generate the loads. We fed that load profile into the uh, larger CARAM model or the heat pump CARAM model. And uh, based on, uh, on the temperatures, we, we looked at, okay, what is the heat that is being rejected into the ground? Um, and then we performed the parametric analysis for the different, uh, uh, the, the, um, the geometry or the different parameters in the ground heat exchanger. And we saw, tried to understand what uh, changing each parameter, what effect that has on the performance. So we changed the spacing between the boreholes, as Curtis mentioned, that uh, in Honda Smart Home, the spacing was 15 feet. You can decrease it or increase it. Uh, we try to understand what the effect of that is on the performance. We change the number of uh, ground heat exchangers. Uh, we change the diameter of the borehole itself. Uh, we tried one, uh, one other arrangement as well. So uh, for all the uh, sim simulations or the parametric studies that we carried out, we took an L-shaped arrangement, but for one particular arrangement, arrangement we had a grid. Uh, and we also changed the height of the coil itself. So, or, or you can uh, think of it as the depth uh, of the borehole. Um, and we also changed the backfill type to understand what impact that has on the ground heat exchanger performance. Um, and in order to sort of see uh, how does that performance compare uh, or what is the potential benefit uh, of the electricity savings or when we are using ground heat exchangers, we used an air source heat pump as a baseline. Um, and again, we use the same load profile uh, for the air source as well uh, to get an apple to apple comparison. All right. So, before we dive into the actual uh, results, um, uh, let's look at the differences in the uh, load profile of the building in uh, Sacramento and Riverside. Um, so the figures on the left hand side show Sacramento 
um, uh, uh, load profiles and we see that the, on the x-axis over here you have first January to all the way up to 30th December hourly load profile of the building uh, when it's positive that means the building needs cooling that's the summer load in blue when it's negative that means the building needs heating or winter load um, and and the pie chart above shows the cumulative load for an entire year uh, whether it's summer or it's winter or whether it's cooling or heating load and the same uh, uh, numbers are shown or uh, in in the figures for riverside on the right hand side so we see that uh, if we compare the cumulative summer cooling load over here uh, for sacramento with riverside they're uh, similar uh, they're within 11 percent of each other but when we uh, look at the winter load, we see the Sacramento uh, cumulative winter load is 2.25 times larger than Riverside. Uh, and we can see that, the, that in the hourly load profile here as well, the magnitude of the load is higher as well as it is, it is more dense when you compare it to the load profile over here for Riverside in which the magnitude is uh, lesser most of the time and it's very infrequent. Um, one interesting aspect uh, as well is that even though the uh, cumulative load uh, of summer is lower in Sacramento, uh, the magnitude can be higher. So you can see that the peak is higher over here compared to Riverside. Uh, but overall, since the load is more frequent in Riverside, the cumulative summer load is higher in Riverside. Uh, we selected these two climate zones because uh, 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 the greatest interest in trying to assess the performance of ground heat exchangers is in the valleys. Uh, and uh, we decided to focus on these two particular zones, which is of interest uh, to our technology partners, as well as to um, other um, manufacturers who want to expand into this market. Now let's look at the actual parametric study results for Sacramento. So before I start explaining the graphs, uh, we need to understand what is the reference condition here. Now this reference was selected such that the performance of the ground heat exchanger does not change uh, in the cooling uh, or in the summer mode year after year. And uh, so, so to understand that is we, we need a reference condition. So this is, this is one reference case in which the borehole spacing is 3.5 meters. You have eight GHEs, the borehole diameter is 24 inch, pipe diameter is three quarter inch. The GHE height or the uh, depth of the helical coil itself is 20 feet and the cost of a single GHE is also shown. Now we, what we did is we, when we're trying to explore, okay, what is the spacing? What is what impact does spacing have? We change this spacing and keep other parameters constant, and thus thus trying to understand what is the impact on the installation cost as well as the electricity consumed. Um, and uh, for uh, furthermore, uh, one thing to note here is uh, the cost of one GHE. About 38% uh, to just give you an idea, 38% of the cost uh, is associated with getting a box GHE. So that means uh, the piping cost, the labor cost in trying to make that GHE. And about 37% of the cost is associated with uh, um, excavation as well as backfill. Uh, so, so you can imagine that if this was a deeper GHE, uh, the cost of installation or, or um, drilling that hole would be much higher. Um, and then you see the optimum case here. Uh, why we have selected this as the optimum case will become apparent uh, in the next few minutes. But for now, this is the condition of the optimum case in which the number of GHE is 12. Cost of one GHE is given over here. Height is uh, 20 feet. The borehole diameter is 16 inch. So it's a smaller diameter GHE and the pipe size is half inch. So now let's look at the, uh, the uh, actual graphs over here. The first graph actually shows the ground heat exchanger installation cost. Um, this ex includes everything that is associated or all the cost that is associated with the ground heat exchanger, but it does not include the heat pump for cost or the cost of installing any equipment inside the building itself. It is just uh, the cost associated with the ground heat exchanger. And we see that the reference cost over here, because you have eight GHEs, eight times 384 will give you this total cost number over here. 
Um, of course, when you increase the, decrease the spacing to 2.5 meters or when you increase the spacing to 5 meters, it has no impact on the cost itself. Um, now, the second figure shows the electricity consumed, total electricity consumed in kilowatt hours per year. Uh, and it shows the electricity consumed of the reference case, which is 1404. And when you decrease the spacing, the electricity consumption increases very slightly. And the reverse is too, true when you increase the spacing. And that's because when the GHEs are further apart, there is a lesser interaction between the GHEs. So you, you see that, um, that playing out over here, but the impact is quite low. Uh, now, uh, when you change the number of GHEs, when you increase the GHEs from eight to 10, of course, the proportionally the cost goes up or when you decrease it to six GHEs, the cost goes down. And in, in terms of performance or electricity consumed, uh, when you uh, increase the number of GHEs, the electricity consumption comes down. Uh, and vice versa when you decrease the number of GHEs. Uh, now, this is the case where the borehole diameter is changed to 16 inch. Now, it's, it's uh, in order to get a better uh, understanding of this, if, you, if we had just decreased the diameter to 16 inch and kept everything else constant, of course, the larger diameter GHE would perform better and it will end up costing more as well. So instead of doing that, what we did is when we increase the, the uh, or when we decrease the diameter of the borehole to 16, we actually increase the number of GHEs to 12. And that was done so that the total borehole area available for heat transfer is same for the reference case as well as 16 inch diameter case. So when you're looking at this particular uh, 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 type of 16 inch diameter GHE, the cost of the GHE is less, but you're using 12 GHEs. That's why the cost is uh, relative, is comparable. It didn't decrease too much. And uh, we see the performance here as well. And we see that the performance of the, uh, of the cost comes down slightly, uh, but the performance also deteriorates. So it ends up consuming slightly more electricity than the reference case. And when we look at the 36 inch GHE, of course, then we, uh, again, when we're increasing the, bo the borehole diameter, we are decreasing the number of GHEs as well as the spacing so that um, the, the borehole area uh, is the same as the reference case. And here we see the cost actually uh, slight, almost same, but slightly less, 30812. Three, and we see the performance actually not being that good. It's consuming about uh, 50 kilowatt hours more um, than the reference case. Um, and then we have this special case of 16 inch diameter GHE with a half inch pipe. So what happens is when you're talking about smaller diameter GHEs or when you're talking about uh, shallower GHE, so this is the 13 foot height GHE, they are often installed with a half inch pipe. So we had to run additional cases uh, to, to sort of uh, simulate what an actual installation would look like. Um, so we can understand what, um, the benefit is we can understand what happens if we just decrease the diameter to, of the borehole. And then this, this figure actually shows, okay, what happens if we decrease the diameter as well as change the pipe size or the tube size to half inch. All the other, uh, uh, for all other cases, the pipe size is three quarter inch. And this, this basically shows the performance and it's in green because this is the optimum case. Uh, and we can see that the cost goes down, the electricity consumption increases slightly, but there's a large decrease in the cost, overall cost over here. Um, and then this is the grid arrangement over here. So for all, all the GHEs that uh, are, for all the cases that we are talking about, the GHEs are arranged in an L-shaped arrangement as shown over here. Um, but the, for the grid case, what we had is uh, we had four by four GHEs over here. And we see that it has, of course, no impact on the cost and no impact on the performance. So it, it uh, really doesn't make a difference in any of those aspects. Uh, when we change the height to 13 feet, again, when we're decreasing the height, we increase the number of GHEs such that the total borehole area is the same. And um, we can see that the uh, cost goes down slightly, 
but the performance deteriorates a lot. It's 1460 kilowatt hours, um, so the consumption is higher. Um, and um, again, we have this special case in which the height is 13 feet and the pipe size or the tube size is half inch. Um, and we can see the performance and the cost over here as well. Um, and then these are the two cases in which we change the backfill. As Curtis mentioned, uh, uh, traditionally or, or um, contractors usually install these GHEs with light sand uh, because light sand is uh, cheap. It does not uh, damage uh, the, uh, the GHE when you're uh, trying to fill it with, uh, with native soil, with heavy clay or anything else. Uh, so these cases, uh, we didn't evaluate the cost uh, of uh, these particular cases, but just to understand how the performance changes, we simulated uh, the electricity consumption for these two cases and we can see that the electricity consumption if you change the soil to heavy clay at 15 percent moisture it uh, the the uh, electricity consumption goes up and when you're using light sand at five percent water uh, the electricity consumption again goes up uh, for all the other cases we use light sand at a higher moisture level at 30 uh, percent moisture level uh, for, for the simulation. And we can see finally the air source case here, which is consuming 1968 uh, kilowatt hours of electricity. And we can see that this electricity consumption for the air source is higher than all other, uh, uh, the, all the other GHE cases, including the reference case. So no matter what uh, type of installation you go with, you will end up saving electricity although you would have to pay the cost uh, shown over here. Now, again, as I mentioned that the optimum case is 16 inch diameter bowl with half inch pipe. And why we selected that as the optimum case will become apparent in this slide over here. Um, so this slide actually shows the cost per annual electricity saved. So in, in the previous slide, if we see that the reference was consuming a certain amount of electricity and the air source was consuming more electricity, we subtract that to figure out what the electricity saving is. Uh, and then we take the cost of installation and divide it by that electricity saving to get this chart over here. So this actually shows you how much money you need to spend to save one kilowatt hour per year. Uh, and you'd want this to be lower, right? You'd want the, want the, uh, the lowest one would indicate, okay, the smallest amount of investment to save the largest amount of electricity. And based on that, this uh, 16 inch diameter with half inch pipe uh, uh, is the winner over here. Uh, one thing to note here is the worst performer is this 10 GHE case in which the cost uh, is 6.65. And um, there are other designs that come close, like 6GHE case, it's, it's pretty uh, good as well. The height of 13 feet and half inch pipe, that also uh, performs relatively well. Um, now, if we can compare it with the optimum, the optimum system, uh, with the air source, the electricity consumed is 28.3% less. Um, and this slide actually shows the seasonal COP, or coefficient of performance, uh, of, of the optimum case and the air source. So you can see that the air source cooling performance is in blue line over here because uh, that performance does not change year after year, of course. Um, and then the air source heating is shown in orange over here as a line. And that's 3.75 in cooling, 3.13 in heating. And the ground heat exchanger performance is shown as these uh, sc scatter plot over here. And we can see that the cooling performance is actually 70% better if you take an uh, annual five-year average. Um, it's 70% better and in heating, it's 36% better. Um, so, so overall, uh, the optimum system is performing much better than the air source system. Um, one thing to note here is that we went with whatever the manufacturer specification is. Uh, for bo so both uh, heat pumps, air source and ground source, are from uh, the same manufacturer and of the same capacity, uh, I think 3.5 tons. Um, and we use the manufacturer data. However, uh, in many cases, the air source performance uh, degrades further due to a variety of reasons. So if you consider all those aspects, these, this performance would actually, or the savings would be even much uh, higher. And I'll talk about that a bit maybe in the next few slides. 
Um, now coming to the uh, Riverside uh, climate zone, and I'm not going to go into all the details here just to save time, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that this is the, the same graph cost per annual electricity saved uh, for all the different cases. Again, uh, the reference case here is uh, exactly same as Sacramento, aside from one change. The number of GHEs is now five. This is five because the overall load in, Sacramento, in uh, Riverside is much smaller than Sacramento, as we saw in the earlier uh, figures. So that's why you can uh, actually install less GHEs and still get the same performance, or, 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 man, or rather, I, sh you should, I should say that you can meet the building load. And the optimum case requires eight GHEs. Um, and uh, again, we can see that the optimum case saves up to 28.5% electricity compared to the air source. This is the optimum case. The optimum case is again, the 16 inch diameter with half inch pipe. And one interesting thing here is that uh, no other uh, design comes close. Like your, your 4.74 here, uh, this one is impressive, but it's still $5.82 uh, per kilowatt hour. So this is a clear winner over here, the 16 inch and uh, diameter with half inch pipe. Um, and uh, if we compare the uh, COP uh, with the air source in cooling, it's 48% better and in heating it's 43% better. Um, now, again, as I mentioned- the Yes. Oh, Anta, I was just, I started to interrupt, but just, we have a few minutes um, maybe for you to wrap up and we do have some questions. So I want to make sure we have, leave a few minutes at the end to answer those. Perfect, perfect. I'll-, I'll All right, great. So, as I mentioned that the conservation, the estimates are conservative because you uh, adjusted the performance to 15% uh, glycol. Uh, we uh, considered the electricity consumption by the circulation pump at a 50% efficiency. And uh, again, uh, the water to water heat pump result is 20% better than the air to water heat pump in general. Um, and I'm gonna quickly move into the helical GHE response factor. So um, even though this was a, a detailed parametric study, you might want to change some of the parameters. You might want to uh, generate the result in a different climate uh, zone, or you might want to change the building, or you might want to uh, use a different heat pump. So for that, all those uh, uh, requirements, uh, what we did is we generated G functions, which are dimensionless resistance factors, uh, and which provide the temperature of the bore wall for a given heat flux profile. And uh, this this basically shows some of the equations, uh, and the chart, the figure on the uh, right, basically shows how how this this method is used and how accurate it is. So uh, the, the blue line, the gray line, uh, which is not visible actually, is the mean fluid temperature calculated from the complete CARAM model, whereas the other uh, blue uh, scatter plot shows the mean fluid calculated from the G function. And the uh, on the secondary axis, you can see the difference. So you can see that the performance or the accuracy is quite well if you just use the G functions instead of using the complete CARAM model. And uh, you can uh, do this, or there are methods to actually generate uh, G functions for multiple GHEs as well. Um, and I'm going to quickly move into conclusions. So um, a CARA model was improved using the CFD model data and Honda Smart Home data. Impact of soil moisture on the GHE performance was measured. Um, and the parametric study of GHE was carried out. The results show significant electricity savings. And finally, the response factors from CARAM were generated, which allow building simulation software such as Energy Plus to model helical GHEs. Great. Thanks so much, Antash and Curtis. That was a wonderful webinar. And we have a few questions here. So I will go ahead. I'm also going to put in the chat box our speaker uh, emails so that you can follow up with them if you would like to email them directly. Um, so that's coming to you in the chat. We have a question from uh, Yuho. So I'm going to unmute you in case you have audio. Um, and if not, I'll answer your question. But you can go ahead and um, ask your question directly. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I think one of my questions has already been addressed um, for the boundary condition. So, uh, oh, you, can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> yes we can. Okay, good. You sound great. Great, thank you. Uh, so I have two questions. One, it's I see you show like the number of hours for simulation, then you show the temperature profile. Are you showing a steady state simulation or that's the, um, you know, I, 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 I 
transient solution. Yeah, it's a it's a transient simulation. Okay, it's transient. Okay. And, and uh, that profile you are showing uh, after I guess 44 hours of simulation or whatnot. That means after the system has reached steady state. Is that is that why so, so you choose? Yeah, so so we uh, in the main paper that we published uh, in applied thermal uh, engineering, we had multiple uh, snapshots, but that is just one snapshot that demonstrates sort of the performance. So the only thing about that was that uh, the heat pump was in operation, and we could see some uh, some of the difference in the prediction of CARAM version one and CARAM version two. Oh, I see. So it's not the the, the forty four hours is not anything special. Yeah, yeah, it's I not see. special. Just take an example. Arbitrary. Okay, yep. and and uh, uh, my second question is that you showed earlier on. I appreciate that you know you know you're talking about fifteen, I guess fifteen dollars per foot and a hundred foot per ton. That gives me a very good um, kind of a, in my head a perspective in terms of cost compares to the air source heat pump. Uh, for your later on on your uh, parametric study. Uh, I think you also showed, then you showed dollars per kilowatts, right? Uh, yeah, kilowatt hour saved, yes, electricity saved, yep. Yeah, so how is, uh, but how how is the installation cost compares to... Um, the, uh, the uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so we... I just want to clarify really quick on touch, that installation cost was for the deep vertical bores with the you know, going 200 feet deep, the cost for the shallow bore is different. But, and, and that's what Antosh was presenting in the parametric study was the, the cost of installation for the shallow bore relative to energy savings. For the so that's the reference case. The reference case, if the shallow bore, uh, then, then, the, then it's the opt optimized parametric study. Am I, and I, I have to step away for a little bit, so I missed the part. You explain what uh, what the reference case is. So the reference case itself uh, has a 3.5 ton. Uh, so, so it's a 3.5 ton heat pump for all these cases. And uh, the cost was, uh, I can go back to that slide, I think 3,000 something um, for the entire GHG installation. Oh, so, so, you, so the 3.5 ton, that's the air source heat pump? That is that is the heat pump size for both the uh, the water to water, which is used for ground heat exchanger, as well as the air source one. We had the same capacity, three point five tons. Okay, thank you. Uh, one additional question from Ricardo. Ricardo, if you have um, if you're near your phone or computer, we'll unmute you here. And Ricardo may not have audio, so um, he had a question about uh, the baseline backfill and was uh, had a question mark if the sand is at thirty percent moisture, the baseline okay. backfill. Yes, that is right. I, I, I answered that as well. Uh, with a, yes, oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a, just a follow-up question to that? Is the, uh, how does that compare to uh, native soil? Yeah, the native soil that we simulated was at 15% uh, moisture heavy clay. Um, the idea, uh, so we did a separate study with, or, or the, rather the lab test that Curtis presented, and we were looking at the um, the thermal conductivity with increase in moisture. Um, and uh, we use the, third, the uh, high moisture uh, considering that, okay, the backfill will be irrigated with gray, gray water. Um, uh, and, but, and, but that's why we have that other study in which uh, the uh, performance at 15% uh, lights with backfill at 15% uh, moisture is also simulated. Okay, thank you. 